Hello, my name is Tyler Ussery. I use the program pronouns he and him and his. Uh, and this is music perception and cognition from a clinical neuroscientific perspective. Before talking about perception and cognition in the grand scheme of music, I do want to talk about the brain itself. We're not entirely sure exactly how music moves its way through the brain from the ear across the brain, but we do know at this point that there are areas of the brain that are responsible for certain things. What's unique to music is that unique, uh, sorry, excuse me, um, that music can connect all of the parts. Music is one of the most unique activities in which you can activate many, many regions of the air, um, many regions of the brain simultaneously. This is good. To, this is to get us started uh, with the larger conversation of music cognition. Uh, before we move forward, I do want to talk about uh, the history of music as it relates to clinical neuroscience. Uh, at the beginning, we have the voice. The voice is essentially the first instrument. While we don't necessarily classify this as an instrument always, this is the voice, which is essentially as valid as any other instrument. But in instruments that we have created, the oldest is the bone flute. And this picture here was found uh, in Germany and dates back to about 35,000 BCE. Uh, this tells us that music has been a part of culture in every culture for the entirety of human history. We know that at this point, historians and scientists agree that uh, music has been present in every culture, in every known history in the world. There is not a single culture that has not included regular musical practice as part of their cultural activities. Um, one major milestone uh, in terms of music cognition research is actually with Pythagoras in uh, discovering music as a propagation of waveforms across a string. He discovered that there are certain ratios that will give certain uh, musical effects based off of how complex that ratio is. So for example, we have a perfect fifth. Consonant ratio, we have a major seventh. Dissonant ratio, minor second really dissonant, and so on. So Pythagoras was actually the first to really scientifically and mathematically uh, log this process of ratios. And this is what gives rise to our scales. So you see in the piano here, this is where we get that. Uh, another major milestone in music cognition is actually with the how we develop music uh, in terms of writing it down and communicating it and developing uh, polyphony and chord structure and uh, larger form. This is where we get a lot of our modern music from. We actually get it from a lot of the Western world uh, with certain innovators like Hildegard of Bingen, who was the first to uh, write down a system for notating music, which was genius for the time. It was innovative. Uh, composers like uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, he was another uh, composer who significantly developed counterpoint to where it's pretty much impossible not to enjoy the music listening to because there's so much expectation involved. We'll get back to there. Um, and next I wanna talk about the Helmholtz resonator. This was essentially the beginning of music cognition where this scientist started taking apart uh, waveforms in their most simple forms. So in, uh, for instance, a sine wave heard here, that is the simplest form of sound. That is the simplest we can get in terms of up, down, up, down, up, down movement in this wave you see right here. If we start adding uh, frequencies on top of this, then we get a more complex waveform. That harmonic sequence is how we started to figure out the way that uh, the physics of sound work. We understand physics now thanks to uh, Mr. Helmholtz and his foundational text on the sensations of tone. Uh, later, Wilhelm Wundt and Karl Stumpf uh, developed different fields of study, such as uh, psychology, neuroscience. You know, they didn't do it exclusively, but they all contributed to this larger uh, field of sound research, uh, so which is called psychoacoustics. And eventually, we have music cognition. Um, in the modern world, we see a lot of uh, musical activity, but we don't see a whole lot of uh, musical research. We do know, however, how the process works. Uh, sound travels through matter in the form of waves. This goes into the ear, and then goes to the brain, which is sensed by a bunch of little hair follicles and nerve endings and such. And eventually we have the cognitive process, which is making sense of all of the sound that we uh, 
sensed and perceived, interestingly enough. Uh, one thing to note here is that if you were to imagine the ear right here, the ear is usually about here on the brain. Uh, in turn, if you were to imagine a 3D structure of this, uh, this is the primary auditory cortex, also right next to Wernicke's area, which is responsible for uh, understanding language, interestingly enough. Uh, this, are, this all contributes to the larger uh, cycle of human uh, perception and cognition in terms of music. And there's really interesting uh, phenomena that happens here. It's basically the cycle of we hear sound, we recreate sound, and then add new things to it. Uh, the details don't matter too much here, but this is the larger scheme of things. Uh, going back to ratios, this is what Pythagoras talked about. And essentially what we have here is the consonant sound at one end, the dissonant sound on the other, and different ratios uh, depending on their complexity, give us our consonant dissonant sound. So we have a unison sound, which would be the most consonant. That's a pure sound in its most basic form. And then we add a lot of different frequencies to it, changing the ratio and making an extremely con uh, complex dissonant sound. Uh, this, in the larger context, uh, contributes to our emotional effect, which can be seen here. Um, a uh, recent study showed 13 unique emotions with over 2,000 participants and 2,000 musical samples. Uh, they were able to identify 13 very specific and unique emotions. Each of these sound samples, which we don't have time for, uh, has a very unique sound. Each is very different in terms of their composer, uh, the time that they made it, and uh, whatnot. But the actual sounds of each are very similar, which is very interesting. Um, some other similarities across cultures, you find um, wind instruments, string, and percussion instruments. These are all uh, pretty much the same in every culture. We, we find different variations of them, but they exist at the fundamental level in every culture. What is not consistent, however, is exactly how we use them in time. Uh, again, returning to the neural aspect of things, we have this picture of the brain. This is basically the, the basal ganglia right here. It's a collection of nuclei that are in charge of a lot of emotion regulation and such. Uh, the striatum is heavily involved in music uh, production and understanding. This all contributes to the larger perception and cognition of music and the, the overall uh, encompassing musical effect. Uh, there are several studies uh, along with this, if you feel free to check them out at some time. But basically, we are realizing that certain areas of the brain activate with certain uh, musical practice. So essentially, in a clinical perspective, we can take uh, certain actions to exercise very specific areas of the brain. For instance, composers uh, use areas of the brain that involve uh, emotional regulation, uh, executive function, planning, organization, all of these things together with various brain areas to form the composition process. This can be realized in a clinical uh, setting uh, in terms of, th this is how we put it all together. If we were to have a certain ailment in the brain, we can exercise that area of the brain through music. Once we figure out exactly, precisely how and where and when music can happen in the brain. This brings us to the present with COVID-19. A lot of students are struggling with motivation. If we can include motivation uh, as, a, as a result of music instrumental training, this is where we can start to find the larger effects of music as they relate to uh, our emotional states and such. Uh, with that, we basically have, in summary, the guidelines and the scaffolding to start curing neurological ailments, not necessarily curing them in all instances, but we can uh, provide uh, solace for them. Uh, and with that, I thank you for your time and wish the best in the future.